All right, friends and neighbors. Hey, welcome back to another networking video. Uh, I was talking with a bunch of students and they were asking me a little bit more about how to process a host routing table. And for that, we need to know a little bit more about IPv4 everyday addressing. Now, it turns out that IPv6 has a host routing table as well, but this one is going to be about IPv4 since really that's still what we do. Okay, so without further ado, let's talk a little IPv4 host routing and everyday addressing. Now, to get us started, uh, we have to remember that the world started off with certain classes of address and really what we're heading towards is binary patterns what are the binary patterns that are shared by these addresses and what are the networks associated with these addresses and so we start off with class a you can recognize a class a network by its first octet so all class a networks begin with 0 to 127 and that's because in the binary, that first octet, the very first bit, is a zero. With class Bs, the very first two bits in the first octet are one zero. And if you take that range of possible addresses, that gives us 128 to 191. So 128 would be 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and 191 would be one zero one 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 class c's all begin with binary one one zero which would give us a range in the first octet of 192 to 223 they all adhere to that okay so that's one characteristic of the class a b and c and those were the addresses or the network types the classes that we used for uh internet addresses from the beginning. Now that's not what we do today. Today we are classless. Another way of saying that is that we have no class, but that's the way that uh, internets started off being addressed. Now there's also class D and E. Class D we can sort of ignore for right now, except for that magic 255 that's out there. Uh, but class D's are for multicast, and they all begin with 1110. And so that gives them a range in the first octet of 224 to 239. So that's our basic rules. Okay, now one other question is how big are class A, B, and C networks? And for that, we have to understand the mask. Now a network mask comes with every single IP address, or I should say that IP, every single IP address comes with a network mask. Now we fill in network masks from the left to the right with ones. So it's all ones are on the left and all zeros are on the right, wherever they stop. The default for class A is to have 255.000. The default for class B is to have 255.255.00. And the default for class C is to have 255.255.255.0. Now what is the point of the network mask. The mask tells you a couple of things. One is it tells you what your network ID is. In other words, what network are you currently part of? What are you sitting on? The other part is that the network mask describes the size of the network. That is to say, the ones indicate the network portion and the zeros indicate the host portion. The size of the host portion tells you how many separate nodes can be on that particular network. The more zeros, the bigger the network is. So when you look at a class A with all of those zeros, and if you converted those zeros to binary, there'd be 24 of them, you would have a really big network. Why? Because the address range that's possible in a class A is enormous. If you compare that to a class C, there are only eight binary zeros. So there are only 256 possible addresses in a class C compared to millions in a class A. Class Bs have 65,536 possible addresses. Now I put an AND gate on this slide because what you do is you take your IP address and you AND it, a binary AND, a binary bitwise AND, you just go bit by bit, 
and you do the anding process. It's a logical and, and whatever happens when you and your IP address and the mask gives you the network that you're sitting on. Now there's a little bit more to it than that, but that's how we'll start. So what we need to get used to is converting IP addresses and masks to binary. And at the bottom, we've got an example here, 245.155.131.15. Convert that to binary and it looks like that. If you end it with a mask, we would get a result and that result will tell us something about the operation that we're in. Okay, so masks tell us two things. One is the network that we're sitting on and uh, maybe how big the network is. Okay, now this is another way to look at those classes. Remember that I said that class A's all begin with a binary zero, class B's all begin with a binary one zero, and class C's all begin with a binary one one zero. With the default mask of 255.000, this tells us where the prefix is, the network portion, and the suffix, the host portion. And this shows a lot of bits for addressing for hosts. And it gets smaller and smaller as we go to class uh, C's. But one other thing that we notice is that the prefix gets larger and larger because the ones in a mask tell us where the prefix is or the size of the prefix. Another way to think about that is how many possible addresses there are in the prefix. So there are not very many class A's because there's only really one byte or even seven bits of addressing for class A networks. So there aren't very many of them. But if we look at class C's, there are a tremendous number of class C networks out there. They're all smaller than class A's, but there's a lot more of them. Now we will see that there are lots of uses for a mask. We use masks in operating systems. We use mask in firewall rules. And the network mask is what we've been talking about so far. But if we want to determine other kinds of addressing, well, we can manipulate the mask or use other kinds of masks associated with it. For right now, what we've been talking about is the default mask associated with different classes of address. So let's do an anding example. Now this is a little bit of an evil one because I decided not to use the class full addressing and the class full masks. And the only reason I did that is to show you that understanding the binary patterns is really, really important. So on the left, we have the base 10 values. And on the right, I've converted them to binary. And when we convert them to binary, we see that I've been up to some monkey shines here in the third octet. When we do the anding, we find out that the network upon which this node is sitting is actually the 200.150.96.0 network. Now, it's really important that you understand how we got there. And the magic is right here in this third octet. When we have all ones, it's pretty easy. And when we have all zeros, it's pretty easy, right? Anything ended with a zero gives me a zero. But here it got a little tricky. And what happened to this one is that it got ended with a zero and I got a zero down below. Okay, so what you should get used to if you're trying to understand this is breaking IP addresses down in binary, throwing them up against whatever mask you're dealing with, and seeing the result. And whatever you get based on the binary anding is the result. If it's a network mask, then you're gonna get the network upon which you are sitting. If we've got other kinds of masks, like we're gonna see here in a second, then you'll get a different result maybe. And then we'll find out what to do with that. But to start off with, we deal with network masks and the default masks for the classes. All right, so where are we going with all this? Well, part of it is the network mass that we were just talking about. But really what we want to understand is how to process routing tables. And this is a host IPv4 routing table. And we can see that it's comprised of a bunch of entries, a bunch of what looks like different IP addresses, and this mask column. And what we do is we use this table to tell us how to forward traffic to various destinations, depending on what's happening in the first column, the masks, and then where are you trying to go. Now, before we leave this routing table, I'm going to point out a couple of things to you. 
we can see that it looks like this is an IP address right here, 192.168.1.2. The one above it kind of looks like a network address. The one below it is a broadcast address. There's our multicast address. Here is one that's all 255s. I don't know about that one. Um, here is, oh my goodness, look at all this 127 stuff. And then here's this crazy entry with all zeros at the top. So we can see that we have a couple that go together. We've got the these 192 addresses here. We've got a couple that end in 255, right? And then we've got these 127s up there. So the whole point here is that we've got some very special addresses, some very, uh, or some addresses that have a very particular purpose. And let's find out a little bit more about what those might be and how we would identify them. Now this top one is a little confusing. All zeros in the prefix and all zeros in the suffix. And remember that this is defined by the mask with the ones, the binary ones in the mask indicating the prefix. Now, if you see a packet with an address like this, it means that you're talking about this computer. So, uh, and actually the example that we see is during DHCP, when a machine is asking for an IP address before it has an IP address. And so it has to use an IP packet to do that, and this is the address that it uses. Now, the reason it's confusing is because Back here, we saw that it also appears here, but this is a routing table entry, and this is for the default gateway, so try not to confuse those two. Now, the other entry that we see in a routing table is when we do the ending process and we're discovering what network we're actually on, the mask will give us the network ID, but the zeros in the mask will provide all zeros in the suffix and so this is an indication of the actual network so when you and your ip address with your network mask you get your network and it'll have all binary zeros all the way on the right hand side now if we change those binary zeros to binary ones we get something called the directed broadcast at your particular network so again it has the network id and but all ones and if it was a whole octet, it would be 255. So the two examples I have on this slide are 129.21.0.0, the RIT network, and then 129.21.255.255, which is the directed broadcast at the RIT network. But in the routing table, we see that we've got 192.168.1.0, for the network and then 1.255 for the directed broadcast at that particular network. Okay, now if we take binary uh, again and we say, well, whatever we define as the prefix, we're going to put binary ones there, and whatever we define as the suffix, we're going to put binary ones there, we get something called the limited broadcast, which is all 255s in base 10. And that is the broadcast on whatever network you're on. So it's not directed at any particular network, it's just on this network. And then anything with a 127 out front is considered loopback, it's testing. You can ping this address, it doesn't generate traffic on the network. All right, so these are some very special addresses that we have to use in our routing table to, to help us get to all possible destinations. So if we take a look at our host routing table again, Anytime I want to talk to somebody on my network, I'll use this entry right here. If I want to ping myself, it'll be this entry. If I'm not sure where my destination is, I might use this entry. If I was going off of my network, I might use the default gateway. And then, of course, we've got our multicast and limited broadcast values here. All right, let's do an example and show how it might actually be processed in the routing table. So let's say that we were trying to go to 192.168.1.10. So the way that this works is we grab the very first entry from the bottom of the routing table. And so that would be this entry down here. Now we're just going to worry about the first and second columns for right now. And so what we're going to do is grab this entry and the first and second columns. And that's these two values here. 
Now, when we add those together, we get 255, 255, 255, 255. Well, how do we know that? Well, this is what it looks like in binary. And when we do a bitwise and, a 1 ended with a 1 gives me a 1 and so on, I would get this particular result. That is half of the equation that we need to solve. The other half is that we're now going to take the destination, in this case 192.168.1.10, .1 and we're going to and it with the mask in the second column. And we're going to get a result. Here we go. Now, the binary looks like this. And what we wind up with is the exact same thing that we started with. And the question is, are the results from these two binary endings the same? And of course they're not, right? I got this result for the first calculation and this result for the second. They're clearly not the same. So what do we do now? Well, we just grab the next entry up and we do the exact same thing. And what we're looking for is a match. And let's see what that looks like. Now I'm going to guess here and say that we will move up through the routing table and we'll find out that none of these will give us the correct match. But what happens when we get to this entry right here? The one net. So let's see how this works. In this case, it's the seventh entry up. So again, we're going to take the first column and the second column and add those together. So just a reminder, that's this entry here and the mask. And we're going to add those together. And it turns out we get this as a result. 192, 1.0. .1 well, here's the binary anding process. That's what that looks like. And then we're going to take the destination and and it with the same mask. And look what we get here. 192, 1.0. .1 and again, this is what the binary looks like. So the whole last octet got zeroed out because anything ended with a zero gives me a zero. And so now the question is, do they match? And they do. So here is the correct entry. So now we would grab the interface to use and use the gateway. In this case, the gateway is the host. So again, here's the entry that matched. It's on link, which means I can talk to it directly. And here's the interface that I would use. So this is telling us that you can communicate with this node directly because it's on your network. Turns out the network mask tells me that this is my network and the destination is also on my network. So there we have it. I hope that helps with some of the special IP addresses that are out there, why we have them, and then we processed an example in the routing table. So this was everyday addressing and host routing. What we find out is that there are seven entries that every full routing table must have on a host. You have one for your network, one for you, one for a multicast, one for a directed broadcast at your network, a limited broadcast, loopback, and a default gateway. Now you can have more than that, right? But to be fully functional, you're gonna have at least those seven. You miss any one of those, and you're gonna have troubles getting to some destinations. The key to all of this is understanding the point and purpose of masks, what is your network, and then can you find the entry in a routing table that matches your destination, the size of the destination uh, address space, and then understanding how that binary ending actually works. Well, there we have it. I hope this helped. Hey, hit that like button if you enjoyed the video. If this helped out, go ahead and subscribe. And may those packets always reach their destinations no matter what routing table entry you have to use.